with you all. Thank you all, first of all, for your presence here. And as I had requested, I expect all of the mobile phones would go on silent. Thank you so much. Hello all, Dr. Purva Deshpande here from SKU. I'm working as a senior psychologist. A very warm welcome on World Mental Health Day event jointly organized by Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing, SKU, and Department of Psy Psychiatry, SMCW, and SUHRC. I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude towards Dr. Girija, head of the department SKU, for this opportunity to compare the program. It has been always inspiring to witness her enthusiasm and adherence to proactive problem solving. She has an amazing way of turning any and every obstacle into a successful opportunity. For the opening words of the day, may I call upon stage Dr. Girija, please? Thank you, Dr. Purva. A very warm welcome to our dignitaries, Dr. Kaustub Zog, Shruti, and Sastekar, madam, uh, for coming all the way uh, here uh, for celebrating with us on the occasion of World Mental Health Day. I would also like to welcome all the esteemed directors, heads of various institutes, faculty members, Team Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing, students from BSc Mental Health, as well as our first year MBBS students. A warm welcome to all of you. So we've gathered here today to commemorate the World Mental Health Day. The theme being mental health is a universal human right. So, wow, it's World Mental Health Day. So I'm sure there are going to be events all over the country today, uh, rallies, slogans, events that will be celebrated. But honestly, what happens tomorrow? Today we will all talk about mental health and tomorrow as I'm walking through the corridor, I will hear statements like, hey, what's this mental health thing? You know, all this is really becoming quite hip these days. Students are nowadays using this excuse of mental health all the time. Oh my God, this employee revealed that he has got depression. Do we want to take such an employee in an organization? No, no, who will take the risk? So is there really a point in celebrating such days? Or is it just one, you know, ha ha uh, event that we, uh, just decide to show off. In my opinion, it's really up to us. Just like on a birthday, we all like to celebrate by cutting a cake. And that's about it. But for some individuals, a birthday has holds a special significance where they make a commitment to themselves to be a better version of their own self. So I guess it's really up to us how much significance we want to give to this day and how we really want to take this forward. But I feel such celebrations are important also to acknowledge the work that is done by mental health professionals across the country. Mental health is really integral to our well-being, And it's not really a luxury or a privilege, but a basic human right irrespective of what age group, sex, gender, socioeconomic status, race, religion we belong to. It's utmost important to understand that health is incomplete without paying enough attention to our mental health. And especially in an organization like a university or a workplace, this really becomes crucial to understand because it intersects with whatever and everything that you really do. So today, our esteemed guests that we have invited have really been working for this cause of making mental health a universal human right. Through this panel discussion, I'm sure 
we will be enlightened as to the amazing work that these three professionals are doing in their own spaces with their team uh, at a community level and at a larger society level as well. I'd also like to tell our guests a little bit about what our center has been doing over the last five years. So the Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing was established in 2018, ma'am, uh, with the vision to create a resilient and commu a compassionate community. We started off with a team of six counselors and myself, and started off with the service wing, uh, providing mental health services across campuses. Soon we realized that the need is really huge and students found that the accessible and easily available services that were free of cost for students really made it easy for them to reach out to the counselors here. So gradually the numbers of students that started to reach out to the counselors began increasing exponentially and we had to expand our team the same likewise. Today I'm proud to say that we are a team of 40 mental health professionals across the university, across 13 different campuses. And each one of them is working really hard with amazing dedication and commitment to the cause of mental health. But just providing services isn't really good enough. I think mental health is on a spectrum. One aspect of it is the psychopathology or the mental illness. But really, I mean, just imagine and reflect for, uh, for a minute and think, each one of us has had some struggles with our mental health at some point in time. Some challenges that we each one of us have had because life is like that. It, there will be ups and downs that we will encounter and that will play an important role in how it impacts our mental health. That's what we describe as distress. Unfortunately, no significance or attention has been paid to these subthreshold symptoms or the distress that individuals experience when they encounter challenges. The Center for Emotional Wellbeing, however, decided that not just providing curative services, but being proactive with promotive and preventive services is also a key to ensure that there is holistic well-being and not just focusing on treatment of mental illness. Therefore, the team does amazing work with raising awareness, destigmatizing mental health, and building resilience across the university stakeholders. We have also now begun the training the trainer workshops. And through this, we build that capacity building is the way to move forward. Our mental health champions program, which we launched three years ago, has been a pioneering effort in building peer support in the university. I'm sure Tahira is going to announce very shortly the number of mental health champions that we have for this year. Uh, so this year we have an astonishing number of mental health champions. So these are student volunteers whom our team will be training through the year to be the first responders on campus. And they will be trained in crisis intervention as well as being, uh, in providing psychological first aid to those in distress. Thank you. And we do truly believe that being in an educational setup, imbibing education in mental health is crucial for overall student success. Our latest endeavor has been to launch the BSc Mental Health Program, which we did last year. As I was just talking to our esteemed guests, we believe that creating a new cadre of mental health professionals is the way to bridge the gap between the current deficit that, we, that our country experiences with res respect to the number of mental health professionals available to deal with the crisis that our country is facing. My hope is that our budding BSc mental health students with the future mental health counselors will be great mental health advocates, will be the key people in early detection, early intervention, crisis intervention, and providing the collaborative holistic care that every individual has the right to when it comes to mental health. I'd like to just end my talk by saying uh, a beautiful song.
खुद को जय करे हमको मन की शक्ति देना थैंक यू सो मच Thank you, Dr. Girija, for those illuminating words and a wonderful, wonderful song. So, with this inspiring beginning, let me take you all to the insightful panel discussion, which is coming up in next few minutes. For that, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Rahul, who is our deputy head, uh, to introduce the panelist and take it ahead from here, Dr. Rahul. Yes, thank you, Dr. Puva. And I'm Dr. Rahul Bagle. I'm psychiatrist and deputy head at Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing. And I think we should start with the panel discussion as per the schedule for this event. And I would just have the privilege to introduce our esteemed panelist and guest, Dr. Kaustub Jok. And uh, so maybe you please give a hi to the students so that they can recognize you. Thank you. Yeah, so Dr. Kaustub is a consultant psychiatrist and a senior research fellow at Center for Mental Health and Law and Policy, which is in ILS, Indian Law Society. He co-leads the Atmiyata project and has worked on the project since its inception. First as the co-principal investigator through its proof of concept stage, and then as a principal investigator for the transition to scale stage. Currently, he co-leads the partnership model with Ambuja Cement Foundation and Hasiru Dala, a social impact organization for the replication of the Atmita model. Dr. Kausub also coordinates the center's international diploma in mental health, human rights, and law. He enjoys music, sleeping, and Bollywood movies in his free time. Yeah, so, so his professional interests are community mental health, ethics in mental health research, and rights-oriented service delivery. So we have the right panelists, what we can say. And thank you, Dr. Girija, for making it feasible that Dr. Kausub could join us today. Yeah. So let's have a warm welcome to Dr. Kausub. I would like to introduce our next guest and panelist, Pooja Nair. She's an MPhil and psychotherapist. Ma'am, please wave off your hands for so the students can add it five. She has been part of non-profit sector for over a decade, and she has worked as a researcher, documentation consultant, and a trainer. She's a counselor with an independent therapeutic practice based in Mumbai. She has MPhil from Tata Institute of Social Sciences and has worked in the areas of life skills training, curriculum development, feminist theory, gender, sexuality, violence, and child sexual abuse. She's also visiting faculty at the psychology department at KREA University. It's in Sri City, Karnataka. Additionally, she is a consultant therapist with Mariwala Health Initiative and also faculty at their flagship Cure Affirmative Counseling Practice course. She's also the co-author for QACP, QR Affirmative Counseling Practice course, as a resource book for mental health practitioners in India. Welcome to Pooja Nair, ma'am. So we have a psychiatrist, we have a psychotherapist, and now it's time for someone from the allied profession. So Dr. Snehal Sasteka, ma'am. She's an occupational therapist. Yeah, she has done her bachelor in occupational therapy from OT school and center at Government Medical College, Nagpur. She's currently affiliated with Regional Mental Hospital, Yervada, Pune, under government of Maharashtra. She has been working in the rehabilitation of persons having mental illness over the last 30 years. She has published numerous articles in Arogya Patrika and also been interviewed on Pune Vivid Bharti. She has additional experience in helping children diagnosed with learning disabilities. She has delivered numerous lectures on stress management, role of exercise and yoga for school, colleges, and Maharashtra police, and also government officers. Welcome, uh, Sneha, Dr. Snehal, ma'am. So as you all are aware about the theme for this year, mental health is a universal human right. And as rightly said by World Health Organization, our minds, our rights. So let's begin with this theme. And we have three key words in this theme. One is mental health, there is a human right, and there is universality which is expected into it. So may I start with the panel discussion from Dr. Kosub, sir? Yes. Okay.
Hello. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Kausuk, Pooja, and Dr. Snehal, ma'am. So, as mental health is the prime thing that is discussed now everywhere, and this year theme is mental health as a universal human right. So, what would you like to define as a mental health, Dr. Kausuk? Please guide our audience, students. Please. Sure. I think I'll start, and maybe uh, my other colleagues will add on to this. <clears throat> I think, as already Dr. Kirija said, uh, kind of I agree that mental health has to be viewed as a spectrum. So that's the first important, uh, I think, point. And mental health, I think for the ages have viewed through the mental illness lens, uh, which has stigmatized and discriminated mental health, uh, as we all know. And we will discuss through this session. That is first point. The second point, I think, what we have to understand, uh, again, if we are viewing mental health as a spectrum, then we have to focus on the social determinants of mental health. Uh, because, uh, you know, again, the, the narrative around mental health is largely focused on the biological or medical narrative. Well, if you work in the communities, then you understand that uh, actual issues around mental health are caused by social determinants. So whether it's a sexuality related violence, discrimination, domestic violence, unemployment, financial issues, and so on. So, so I think these are the two points I think which we need to understand when we talk about mental health and we need to factor in these two points. So we should not be restricting this to any disorders. There are other community and social factors also interplaying when we, the, we consider the mental health and that you would like to highlight here, right, sir? Ab absolutely, absolutely. And maybe because I'm from a medical science background, I should talk a data. So, so if you see the data also, I think the evidence is uh, the severe mental disorders or severe mental health issues, which are which have high uh, biological, in a sense, uh, what you can say, the background in that sense, have only one or two percent of the population prevalence. And, and if you see 98 percent of other mental health issues are related to distress, common mental health issues like anxiety, depression, and so on and so forth. So obviously the focus has to be, which is majority of it. The narrative cannot be built on one or two percent of it. I'm not trying to say exclude them, but basically point is the narrative is completely medicalized because we only see uh, mental health as a uh, severe mental illness lens. And that's that's the, I think, the, the problem. So I think unless and until we shift the narrative towards the social, towards the psychological, uh, you know, kind of a lens of a mental health, it would be difficult to uh, even tackle the stigma. We will talk about that, but Absolutely. that's my point. Thank you. Uh, Pooja, you would like to add something to this? Um, so I, I think it's always a good idea to start with a very basic uh, understanding or a question on mental health because we also tend to build so much on that that it, it, we sometimes lose touch with our uh, sort of basics and that kind of clarity with which we work. And when I say mental health, of course, I'm adding to uh, what Dr. Kaustuf has just said. When we say mental health, we will have to see it as something that affects all of us. Yeah, it is not an out there subject. It is not for somebody else. We have to implicate ourselves if we are to talk mental health, not just because we have mental health of our own, but also in the ways that it impacts social life. Uh, for all of us, you know, because we are all, um, to use a cliche, we are all social beings, we are all interconnected, we have the capacity to connect with others, and, and that's how we enrich our lives, right? If something affects that capacity to connect, I think it requires attention, and to also look at then who does not have access to this kind of connection, who is left behind when we say we all have mental health. You know, who, who am I imagining when I say mental health? So, I mean, just setting off a few questions in general, yeah. They are quite insightful for the students as well, that when they're looking at the mental health cases or they are thinking about mental health conditions, they could see the social determinants and other factors also into it. Yeah. Snail ma'am, from the rehabilitation perspective or any from anything from the community perspective, what you have experienced in your uh, long 30 years experience, please share your insight. Uh, about mental health, yeah, sir. Mental health from the community. Uh, basically, first, uh, mental health is something which people just neglect. When I uh, go in community, when I meet people, uh, basically that is something people totally neglect and they never realize mental health is a thing which has impact on each and every aspect of our life. Now, when we say mental health, 
we say it's physical mental and social well being mental health is not the absence of disease or something like that it has to be all these three and mental health is a totally neglected uh, topic uh, since last few years i think people are paying some attention to it but uh, uh this is what my experience is it is totally neglected and it is very important part of life and because we neglect it initially then uh, that problem uh, goes on increasing and we face uh, more severe problems that is what i feel yeah so bringing about awareness is important because yeah, of the yeah, neglect yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's very important and not only in community but uh, even professionals also yeah. even health professionals should be made aware uh, of mental health and everything right thank you panelists and may i move to the next question related to this uh, panel discussion now see when we are seeing other themes by world health organization every year it was initially like making a global priority and all or making the accessibility but now the first time we are seeing that there is something a human rights angle been into focus mental health as a human right universal human rights so why it is needed that human rights should be incorporated into the persons having mental illnesses what is the angle attached or anchor anchoring with the mental health issues or persons having mental illness with this uh, human rights yes. i suppose <laughs> um so um i think it's it's really important that we make these connections that we connect mental health to human rights because first of all as i said earlier it's about all of us number 1 um the second thing is that mental health needs to be thought of uh, and i'm still building on what dr kosum says on two sort of um, uh, classifications one is access to quality mental health care that everyone has a right to if they are in distress or if they are uh, dealing with mental health challenges mental illnesses everyone has should uh, be able to access quality mental health services without the fear of discrimination because now as you as we start working in community mental health we know that uh, having a good doctor in a hospital is not enough there are layers that separate you from accessing this medical professional there are layers of discrimination for example we work so much on queer mental health and we know that trans persons might just step away from the gate itself by how they are treated on that first leg of access you know so uh, when we say quality mental health care services formal services institution based services we mean all levels of access have to improve and the other thing is that the more we start linking mental health to social factors firstly we are the first reaction is utter frustration because we realize the social is so huge so powerful but we also do go uh, we also do um, cross that river of frustration to say that if we have to men work on mental health we will have to work on the social as well we will have to start thinking what else has to change in our systems in our social structures in order to reach this promised land of mental health for all so i think we we encounter these questions these difficulties as we work and and then that's where we uh, sort of i think move, make headway so having the accessibility is important when we are considering as a human right people should be able to reach and they should be acknowledged with their own identities in, without any discrimination or without any flaws or something yeah dr kosu would you like to add you are working into mental health law and policy so i would like to hear you from you also would like to hear that yeah so maybe <clears throat> before law policy uh, as puja also said i think i'll just step back and say why we should talk about rights uh, i think it's in, important i think the connection is because people with mental health issues or mental health conditions are also humans and and that's why we need to talk about the rights and this is a i, th I think a, what i can say is the sad thing that we are talking about the rights uh, to be basic to start with every human being needs to be given rights and historically as we all know uh, that people with mental health conditions has been denied of their rights whether it's a civil rights whether it's a political rights whether it's a all marriage related rights property related rights and so on and so forth uh, and then coming back to the mental health treatment so what i'm trying to say is if you if you see around you people who have a mental health conditions has been discriminated from all parts of their lives uh, everything may if you see marriage if you tomorrow go to a you know any marriage system 
if you have a mental illness, you are discarded from that system uh, without asking any question or without uh, doing anything. If you voting, if you people know there is, you know, even if, uh, you know, voting is a basic right, fundamental right given to all of us, but many people with mental health conditions do not have that right. Banking system, you know, property, people with mental health issues do not have those rights. And even if they have a right on the paper, it's not fulfilled basically in the day-to-day -day life. So I think my point is basically, because these rights have been violated for now ages, like centuries actually now, that's why we have to talk about human rights. Uh, and, and this is a good theme that this is coming through. And, and as a professionals, I think, because largely we are professional, either a health professional in the mental health, uh, we have to be part of this journey of uh, fulfilling and promoting rights for people with mental health issues. Because unless and until we don't talk about it. I don't think, uh, you know, we are going to, you know, our communities are not going to talk about it. So, so that's, I think, the first important point. As I think Pooja said, I rightly agree that access to mental health care is the huge problem and is the huge issue. Multiple issues there or multiple causes for that. Uh, we may talk about it later. But, but the access to mental health care has to be a, a fundamental right. And thanks to the current Mental Health Care Act, I don't know how, how many of you who are in the mental health uh, now curriculum also have read Mental Health Care Act, but I would urge that you should go back and read Mental Health Care Act. Uh, this is the first time the Mental Health Care Act or as a law uh, has given the right to mental health care. And the funniest part in India, as we always say, there is no right to general health care, but there is a right to mental health care. So it's a paradox actually. So, but, but the point is again, why we are talking about right to mental health care? Because I think almost more than 80% people with mental health condition cannot access mental health care. As, as uh, Pooja said, the example of trans people. Uh, similarly, multiple, like in the rural population, there are marginalized communities, caste wise, religion wise, who cannot access mental health care. And that's why I think uh, there are multiple rights we can talk about, but I think uh, the focus has to be first that how can we improve the access to mental health care? Because if there is no access, then there is no point in talking about, you know, quality, affordability, and uh, adapt, uh, acceptability of the care. Because if there is no care, then what, what kind of uh, affordability we are talking about? So I think on all rights from law and policy perspective, uh, and that's what I think, many states are now doing, uh, which is good, that they are trying to improve the access to mental health care. So that's yeah. my What about a very important topic, Dr. Kosu, that they are human. This is the first thing that we need to understand when we are talking about human rights. It should not be like uh, they, was, they versus be. They, they are part of the community and they should be part of the community throughout their illnesses. That is what can be, I can summarize what you said with the affordability and accessibility for the service. Absolutely. So just a small incident. So when I attended first time I did, uh, so again, coming back from a psychiatric training, frankly, uh, and I think all the psychiatrists here will agree that these terms were completely, uh, you know, <laughs> completely not there in our curriculum. So whether you say rights, whether you say community mental health, it's unfortunate. I'm smiling, but that is because of the <laughs> sadness of it. But that is the problem, you know, that and I, I, um, yeah, I fortunate that now the BSc mental health, as we are talking, will have this kind of a exposures to these words. Coming back to this point, so when I did my diploma on mental health, human rights and law, so one of the faculty member asked this question to start with, ki why there are, why we are talking about rights? So everyone gave a different answers. And then his point was because I think because we are humans, we have to talk about rights. So that's the ba basic fundamental thing because as a human being, so it's not about country, it's not about state, it's not about anything, you know, as a, as a human being all over this world, uh, as, as some of the fundamental principles we have all all of us have equal rights and all of us have a, you know rights to do uh, everything so before we move ahead with the next panelist dr snail ma'am i have a slide which is uh, visually disturbing to see but it is the fact in august 20 august uh, 2001 in tamil nadu there is a place called ervadi mental asylum by faith healers it is not a proper uh, mental health care service it is a faith healing kind of a system. And unfortunately, the mentally ill patients were chained there to the trees. And there was a fire that occurred. And that unfortunately led to demise of many mentally ill patients over there. And this was in 2001. So still we are lagging, I feel, that after 22 years, we are coming to the rights aspect. 
on World Health Organization saying. So it is taking, so these kind of incidences are just the tip of iceberg. There are many things which are happening, which can be inhuman or which are violating the rights of persons having mental illnesses. So maybe we can try to explore it from your clinical experience, ma'am, that when you see the patients in uh, some tertiary care hospital or regional hospital, so what kind of a rights you see that they have been not been looked into or they need to be told to the relatives and sometimes patients also that this is your right, you should stand for it. Uh, I would uh, like to say something about uh, uh, Sir said right for treatment and availability and all. I think there should be, uh, law says there should not be any discrimination. But what my observation in working mental hospital is, uh, male patients are uh, uh, taken for a treatment uh, very easily, where females uh, are not treated that way. I mean, it's always like uh, females are treated as second citizen. Few people may, uh, may not like my statement, but <laughs> it's the fact. And it happens in mental hospital also. You are a psychiatrist. You tell me, is there anything that says males are more affected by psychiatric illness than females? No. Suppose it, by the way, for some disorder. <laughs> no, no. We are talking in yeah. general. Yeah. It's not that males are affected more. But in mental hospital, when uh, there are 1,000 male patients, uh, indoor patients, I'm speaking, a female so number is uh, around 500 or 600, half. Even in OPD, we have more number of male patients. So what happens if a male has a mental illness, he is uh, uh, given treatment on priority basis because he's an earning member, because he's a prime person, in, whereas female is neglected. So I think there should not be this discrimination both should get the treatment equally. Then about cruelty, sir, uh, I will uh, tell you uh, an example. Last month, I was just walking towards uh, OPD and uh, there was a tempo, that 407. You all know that open tempo. Have you people seen, uh, they put some guy bias over there to uh, get them for one place to another, from one city to another. You all have so I saw there was, was a man, a human being, he was tied in that tempo. Uske dono haath, dono pair, wo tempo ke side ke, uh, wo wow. rods mein bandhe huye the. Kahan se aaya tha malum nahi, number plate was not from Pune. So he must have traveled a lot. Aur wo situation mein baan ke, he was taken to mental hospital in OPD. This is extreme cruelty. So I think this is again a very mm. big issue, sir. They are treated very many times i won't blame relatives because those patients they are beyond control they are uh, hurting themselves or hurting other people so they don't have their accessibility at their yeah places. exactly they can't they, do any chemical tranquilization even, or something yes yes there. sir even today patients travel from bead aurangabad nanded which is more than 300 kilometers and if you uh, don't have a treatment till you travel 300 kilometers those relatives are also helpless so I think uh, uh, when you, we talk about rights, this is the fact today. Yeah, this just reminds me about my residency days when I did my post-graduation. So if you can also remember, Dr. Kostup, sir, for males, it used to be 20 bedded capacity in a uh, 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 HPU psychiatry unit. And in females, there are just 10 beds. So it's, does that mean that the prevalence is less or the, uh, is there any disturbance that they are not able to accept this care. It is not so. There are needs. Sometimes we had to put the patients on floor also, to be frank. So this is a case at tertiary care hospital in Mumbai, where there is this kind of a discrimination that male beds are 20 and female beds are 10. Unfortunately, we are in Symbiosis Medical College for Women. I see there are many aspiring medical doctors and future psychiatrists, perhaps. So they can do something to this kind of injustice, what I have realized today in this session now. Yeah, thank you, ma'am, for making us aware that what kind of a discrimination it is just about male and woman. There are other genders also we need to discuss. About one more yeah. thing, uh, in any hospital or where there is a section reserved for males, for females. But few days back we had a problem when a transgender was was admitted in the hospital, and we did not know where to put him. So it was very difficult for our psychiatrists to. Uh, uh, admit him and treat him, then um, somehow uh, they uh, saw the inclination and all, and then he was isolated in female section and he was treated. 
but uh, this is again when we are talking about rights i think we should consider this also they are quite vulnerable and the patients are not having sometimes that inside that how they should treat some other genders they are not sensitized also so it is very uh, difficult question i see that when transgenders and other genders are getting into a mental health establishment how few friendly their hospital seats and how they can get the all the facilities including hospitalization and that is a big challenging issue in our setups so so how to br now bringing about this awareness and sensitivity so what is the current status of mental health awareness in marginalized population you can go ahead with uh, pooja ma'am now that how you would like to say that how people are aware about the lgbtqi community we community or other marginalized population who are oppressed from years for the accessibility of the mental health care what are your observations from the field you have been experiencing okay so since i have been involved in teaching and all i'll be speaking both as a learner and as a teacher and um, in terms of awareness i think it's not um, it's not that awareness is present or absent but what is it that we are aware of because our curriculum or what we generate today as knowledge is based on the most visible um as you said that minority which can be clearly marked as the outsider and therefore we create knowledge about that and we try to create knowledge from a sense of okay this is the mainstream this uh, this sick population or the ill population is on the margins and now we have to try to cure them and bring them into the center of or in the midst of our society make them habitable and make them fit for our society so that's the kind of approach with which knowledge exists so if i say that there is lack of awareness that's not true but would i say that there is inadequate awareness yes would i say that there are there is a lot of misinformation i would say yes is there a lot of prejudice and stereotyping i would say yes so so when we say we have to bring about awareness i would always also want a follow up of follow up question of what kind of awareness are we talking about and if we really want to learn more about lives on the margin so marginalized and discriminated lives we will have to know it from there we will have to learn from the marginalized the impact of this marginalization it is not fair for me to talk about the mental health effect of poverty on some other person i have not experienced it i do not know what it is and therefore i must not be the expert of that experience so i think when we say awareness we have to have this quick follow up of what is it that we don't know and where are we going to learn it from absolutely thank you pooja ma'am so we also have to share something as a statistics for here all students that as per national mental health survey 2017 there are at least 10 crore people who have some diagnosed mental health conditions out of which 1 crore individuals have a serious mental health condition it is a big population i don't know whether any politicians or any social policy makers are aware about this large chunk of 10 crore people are they aware about what they can do for them because they are absolutely seeking for some kind of assistance and some kind of improvement in the infrastructure they are having so this is a big population we if we see it is almost 1/10th of the population of india it is across all age spans so there is a disability related thing also we are going to discuss so disability is for individuals they might be aware about the physical disability which is quite visible there is a disability in mental health issues also so i would request dr kaustub to share something about the disability and what kind of a disabilities people persons having mental illness can experience and how they it can impact their functioning or their ex excellence in their careers or their professional lives or even their personal growth so maybe i'll start but dr snail will add because she works in the mental hospital and has a huge experience working with people with uh, psychosocial disabilities uh, so the terminology wise what we called as a people who have a mental illness is largely the severe mental health issues or even you know uh, long standing uh, depression anxiety uh, basically it impacts your functioning largely as any other people who have a physical disability the way it impacts their functioning similarly the premise is the same the mental health affects their functioning and that is why uh, the psychosocial disability is the terminology uh, is, is is used uh, when we talk about the mental health related disability uh, the important point about disability and this i am talking from 
all the disability perspective it's not only about mental health uh, related disability or psychosocial disability but uh, and this is now almost 15 16 years uh, or maybe 20 years since the journey of uh, uncrpd which is convention on rights for people with disability started by united nations and the convention has changed this narrative and that is why i think we are now more and more talking about rights language why are law and policies talking about rights because i think the construct of disability or the or the uh, the what you can say the meaning of disability has completely changed uh, and now, now we have to focus which is the right meaning actually is the social construct of disability what does this mean if you you know if you even get to the literature or typical medical textbooks the disability is taught like the disability is the issue with the person so whoever is the person uh, has the uh, because you know he has the let's say uh, i'm taking an example of a physical disability so if a person has a blindness then the blindness is his or her disability or their disability and not the problem with the environment what crpd says it is not the case because we have made the world for all the people who have vision the blindness is the disability you know imagine if 90 percent of people are were blind then obviously the people who have a vision would have become the disability so so the environmental sense in a simple logic if somebody is on a wheelchair and if your campus does not have a ramps then then i think the for them the access to this facility is not possible and then this this building construction of this building is making their disability pronounced it's not because they have they are on the wheelchair so i think for us again from a professional perspective i'm talking we have to change our construct and narratives uh, which are taught to us like you know so and what happens and why this construct is important because once we say that person who has a disability is a problem then everything comes on the person basically so the recovery also comes on the person he or she has to take a treatment while when it is we say the social construct is the issue then the laws and policies will change to make the environment change otherwise you know that is why you know in healthcare also if you see everything is driven by only the treatment perspective and how to correct that person and as puja said you know how to bring them somehow include them into society they are part of the society they are not uh, you know the outside of the society so I, I think this around disability we need to get these uh, concepts clear i think if we get the concepts clear then i think it's easier to work with the people with the uh, uh, mental health issues last point i will make so again, the why this construct is important, what at least from my learning and as a practicing psychiatrist. So see, largely when you say the disability is the person-centric issue, then the approach is a sympathy driven, which we still see. So it's a lot of sympathy given to the people with disability. And if you say that the, it is not their problem, it is our problem of uh, because the world we have made, then it is more empathy driven approach because now we understand the problem lies both sides. Problem doesn't lie at one side. And I think that you know narrative has to change for the reason. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Kostu. Uh, Dr. Snehal, ma'am, uh, maybe what would you like to suggest about uh, this disability? Because when I see the district hospitals in a city like Pune, there is at least three months of waiting time for getting a disability certificates who are qualified with some kind of a condition, and they have to bear that time because of the increasing number and less number of professionals who can do this testing and provide them the proper certificate through government channels. So this is the current condition. And how would you like to bring about stress on this topic that disability? Sir, uh, about, and, yeah, about, about, disability rights, yeah. about disability certificate, uh, I would like to tell you one thing. Uh, for this mental disability, mental hospital and Sassoon hospital, they also uh, work on this disability thing. So a uh, person with a mental illness can approach mental hospital. He could register from there and uh, he gets his disability certificate there. So uh, there will be less burden on the general hospital like Aund or so. So uh, this is again facility which, uh, uh, and nowadays what we do when patients come to our OPD, we do their registration there only. Uh, or uh, uh, all the patients who are admitted in our hospital, we did their registrations and uh, th they have started getting those benefits and all. So this is, I will like to tell something about disability certificate. Absolutely. Hmm. Everybody's taking steps towards it. 
I was just trying to say about the children who are facing to learning disabilities or some other disabilities. They have to be keep on waiting. I think Dr. Harish Shetty sir filed once a PIL, and after that it was bringing into recognition. Otherwise, nobody knew that if somebody is not able to do maths, it was always a punishment that their child is going to face. But now people are taking it in the recognition that maths is not been done. Let us ask the professional, the child psychologist, what is it going through? Is it something related to a disability because of the brain wiring that person is having and that person is not able to make the calculation or is it because of lack of available resources or lack of training also? So this distinguishing feature may be important. And I have one more visual from a mental health institute, which is available on YouTube. This is about the institutionalized setting where around 20, 30 years back, or if you have seen the movie Shutter Island or something, so you might understand that what kind of uh, asylum looks like and what kind of uh, patients are been depicted through movies and what exactly it happens in there. But now the pol uh, with the policy makers, it is moving from institutionalization to the community and how persons having mental illness should not be uh, restricted into their men uh, mental health asylums and they should become part of community through halfway homes and any other measures. So that is the goal towards our future things. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kostup, sir, of how law and policy makes an uh, important angle into this thing that how the rights of persons having mental illnesses can be preserved through laws and policy. Maybe you can guide about what are the rights of persons having mental illness also through MHCA. So, you know, I think all of us are uh, adults. And uh, so once you become adults, I think you know that you have already kind of a given by your age you have rights like voting is a very classical example like uh, and why voting becomes rights after the age of 18 because there is a law saying that so what i'm trying to say ki why law again in many people have asked ki why there is a mental health care law while in india there is no health law uh, and then why there is a mental health care law so just coming back to this point why there is a mental health care law because the rights of people with mental health conditions have been violated for the ages and because you know the as you said rightly the institution is the only epitome of the mental health care while there is a huge gap in the community mental health huge gap in the services to marginalized population and so on and that's why the law is largely uh, kind of a mandated so uh, again people who are doing mental health need to understand the law history of law in mental health goes back to the british era so 1912, when the Britishers have got Indian Lunacy Act to start with, which then kind of a reform to 1987 Mental Health Act. And because again, Lunacy Act obviously was quite barbaric. It was, you know, that is how the we are talking about the state of a mental hospital, how they have been, uh, you know, actually built against the jail so that the, you know, the, the and the terminology is used, you know, all the terminology is used in the mental hospital are similar to jail, basically. So like uh, people with mental illnesses, like they have, kind of committed crime. So all this language also was used like that in the law. So that has changed in 87 a bit, but not completely. And that is where the Mental Health Care Act come in. Mental Health Care Act is just a, basically a, a step which is a necessary after the CRPD. So Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities by United Nations is the convention which every country has signed basically. And once you sign and ratify the convention, your laws and policies has to be aligned with that. So that's the mandate basically. And that's why uh, whether it's a willingness of a politician or a willingness of a policymaker, the answer may be no. 
uh, it was largely mandated by the United Nations that all of your mental health uh, or health related laws and policies has to be in line with UNCRPD. And basically the CRPD talks about the rights. So, so if you read a preamble of a CRPD, CRPD talks about that the, the convention is all about promoting, fulfilling and fulfilling rights of people with disabilities. So that's the, uh, and protecting, sorry. So protect, fulfill and promote. So these are the three words used in the CRPD. So that is how, if you read Mental Health Care Act, there is a separate chapter on the rights of people with mental disabilities or mental health issues and the rights then all these rights, people, you know, if you read the chapter, they will talk about, like we discussed, right to access to care, like we talk about right to community integration, right to affordability, quality mental health care, and so on and so forth. The last point I want to mention, already I think there is a movement which has been started around what we call as a deinstitutionalization. And I think that is a very important step because uh, uh, as we know, the mental hospital, unfortunately, though it's a tertiary mental health care, has been become a seat of a stigma and discrimination. Like in Pune, for example, or in Mumbai, people know ki, if anything happens in home, they will say ki, you will be sent to Thane or you will send to Yeroda. So it is used as a slang language. And the slang language ultimately becomes a fear in minds of people. So if at an adolescent age, if you say, ki, you know, in Marathi, ki, tula kai dhala tar, tula yaroda patri, so that becomes the fear in mind of people. And that is how people view the mental health. You know, so that is why deinstitutionalization is the next thing which is already United Nations is taking up seriously. World Health Organization is taking up seriously. There are already few European countries who do not have a, a, a long stay institutes basically. So there is a rehabilitation centers, which are very few people. Then there are halfway homes for people who have already recovered. And then they have a community practice home where people can get reintegrated into community. So I think this is a very important point uh, from the institution's perspective. And coming back to your question, that is where the law and policy has a huge role to make. Because if you make the law and policy, then state or the government is mandated to follow the law and policy. And that is how, like you said, Dr. Harish Shetty, you know, went to the high court. Now, why high court has to take a cognizance of that PIL? Because this is, there is a mental health care act or there is a national mental health policy. If there is, there wouldn't have been law and policy, court would have said they can't do anything basically. So that's how the law and policy now becomes tool for every of our individuals who can use this tool to, uh, you know, promote, fulfill and protect rights of people with mental health issues. So that's... Absolutely. Promoting, protecting and fulfilling the rights is what when we say the rights-based approach in mental health care service delivery. And also about uh, this uh, issue, so about uh, the laws and policy, uh, anything from your point of uh, experience, ma'am, Snail, ma'am, or Pooja, ma'am, about laws and policy or how they are important, like what we, visuals we saw, that the person having mental illness, he was asking that his family should take him and he was not been uh, able to reach his family because we find that in mental hospitals also, it becomes sometimes just the people are being dumped there because the relatives get absconded and many social workers do a lot of work to find out their family members, convince them that the person is now treated well, he just needs a treatment and the family-based care. And there is difficulty in identifying the relatives and reaching them or making them rehabilitated into their own places. So what challenges you see from the relatives or caregivers' perspective there? Uh, there are many challenges. First challenge is uh, patient being accepted from the family, accept, accepting him back. Uh, many times, once they put him into a mental hospital, they have the idea they are going to dump the patient there. They don't want him back. Then till your parents are alive, at least they take you back uh, for some days or some months, something like that. But what happens when the parents die? Uh, their uh, siblings, or if they don't have siblings, the distant relatives, they say we are not responsible for them. So where to send these patients? That is our very big problem. Right now, mental hospital has n number of recovered patients who don't have homes, who don't have any family, and we don't know where to send them. So they are dumped in mental hospital. Uh, so this law will be very helpful, uh, uh, like the law says, if uh, we could uh, put up uh, halfway homes or uh, uh, some daycare centers or sheltered workshops, they, they will be very useful. But I think uh, usually what happens, such things, they uh, are available in cities only. 
and uh, mostly in mental hospital our most of the population is from rural area so i think these facilities they should be available there also then uh, this problem uh, will be a bit less severe also and then of course uh, awareness and counseling of people uh, actually they fear uh, they ha what happens they see that uh, uh, initial phase of uh, that illness so they always fear ki he will do something when he comes back home he will be threat for us and all and they don't want him back so uh, if we increase the awareness how good medicines are available nowadays how other treatments are available nowadays and then you could uh, take him back in home that is also again important if we want to face this problem but nowadays what is happening because of that uh, harish shetty sir, sir's case what government is doing actually i don't know whether i should be saying this or not <laughs> but uh, what happens we need to answer in court if we are doing Uh, something to take them like out yeah 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 so what government is doing they are uh, discharging them from mental hospital they and they are giving them to some institutions private institutes but what i personally think as a occupational therapist that is not a rehab that is something like wo dharan grasta lokanna ek ikad utsalla ani dusri kade zamin dili so it's exactly same for those patients they are taken from government mental hospital to a private mental health care facility so unless and until we have these halfway homes and sheltered workshops it is not possible uh, to do complete rehab of these patients so i think law has said we should do this but when that comes in real picture yeah. so we are going to that reach will be... to the uh, challenges when we are actually implementing yeah. these policies and laws uh. so before that i have one more visual i just want to add yeah, yeah. To the yes ma'am please yeah hmm. um so um perhaps this is a bit of a tangent or perhaps i'm uh, ideating a bit much but that happens to me when i'm in an educational space and and therefore i'm pushing some boundaries of the practicality of our discussions as well and when you talked about deinstitutionalization i was also thinking of how to complicate deinstitutionalization a little bit which has been done and speaking also from uh, my experience um, at mhi and uh, the work we do on queer mental health is this idea that the family is the be all and end all of uh, care and an alternative to institutional institution based care is family care now uh, it's difficult for many many reasons one could be poverty disability requires resources there may not be those kinds of emotional or financial resources and therefore families just might find themselves incapable of supporting someone the other reason could be what happens to queer and trans people families are hardly these nice cocoons you know all it takes is one coming out and the unconditional love fairy tale collapses in a in a flash so when we know that this relationship with birth family or natal family marital family all these families are all these relationships are so conditional based on you conforming to some very arbitrary rules be heterosexual be cis get married have children preferably boys all of these rules when you tick all these boxes be mentally okay be physically okay only then are you provided family care so if we are talking alternatives and since this is a space where we are talking community mental health i think uh, i just wanted to make this little bit of a connection here yeah thank you thank you dr pooja ma'am that it's very really interesting to know that what kind of a conventional ideas that a generation is just uh, transgressing to the next generation and that's how impacts the uh, pre choice of what kind of a, uh, their identities and their experiences they can freely share in their mental health domains Yes, Doctor. So, do you want to add something? Just to add what Pooja said, I completely agree fully with that, and that's why just for all the people who are, you know, in the in the training stage for while professionals. So, uh, just on the deinstitutionalization, uh, South Africa actually was the front runner in this case, and they uh, back in 2018, the government, you know, suddenly said that yes, we have to stop or we have to close the mental hospitals. and and as uh, puja just said uh, what i remembered is if you are not prepared for the deinstitutionalization then what happens is the case study of a south africa so there was a region called as a guatang 
in the south africa where there was like biggest mental hospital who they suddenly overnight they closed the mental hospital and they transferred those people to various uh, communities basically and 135 people died in that uh, uh, in the case so it's a it's a very uh, huge case study became a huge national issue and then they stopped those uh, basically that kind of a, a policy basis so they made a policy of a deinstitutionalization they started the work and then realized if you are not prepared for any kind of a community care if you are not you know, it's a, it's a stepwise process. You can't just stop the mental hospital tomorrow and just start saying, as Pooja said, that send everyone to their families. It's not going to happen like that. Uh, so I'm just saying ki, from an educational point of view or the, from a law and policy point of view, this is a very, it's a bad, obviously, the example, but it's an example for many state policymakers that if you are talking about deinstitutionalization, then what needs to be done? And then WHO has you know, kind of a studied that had had a huge report on that, which just published in 2021. So maybe all of you can go through that. That's yeah, the, so this gradual shifting from institutionalization to deinstitutionalization and making them be part of the community is what required. And who is a significant carer? Because um, uh, I mean, uh, Mental Health Care Act has that option of the advanced directive and nominated representative. So Shruti here has also written a piece on reimagining it for queer and trans people who lose access to their uh, marital homes. Perhaps that can be circulated also. Yeah. So we have one more visual for the female gender that what kind of a condition we have at mental health settings in India. And it is a public domain on YouTube. <laughs> So these are some social issues what we see with women gender that gender thing i will like to add something we have many uh, female patients who are recovered but are there for a very long period because nobody wants them who will take them home what happens when if they are married if they get mental problem what husband does he sends her back to her maternal home he gets married again it's very easy for him to just throw away that wife now her maternal family, they think it's his responsibility. So what they do, they admit her to mental hospital, then they change the phone numbers, then they change the houses. So you can't trace them back. We have many female patients and like uh, about discrimination, I said even initially, this is again very serious issue we face with female patients. So that's why we are trying to bring this as a universal. It is not just about men, women or other genders. It is for everyone as rightly said, uh, drafted by United Nations Convention for Rights of Persons with Disability, it has become a universal phenomenon now. So I just remember one incident in my residency also, that when uh, maybe medical students, when they are going to a psychiatry wards or students from BSc mental health, if they are going for any cases to see in psychiatry ward, if a patient is violent, many times you will see that other residents, other department residents will be very scared that he might shout, he might get angry or get physically aggressive and they are just refraining to talk with that person. But what a mental health professional does, he just talk with that person as being human and that person just connects with that person that, okay, you, somebody is listening to me. Okay, somebody is keen on listening to me and helping me in what problem I'm going through. And this attitude shift is what we expect from the training of uh, you students. So this is also one part that how you treat that person that the same person is going to reflect back. And this is important. Now we come back to the challenges that what challenges we face. And this is the last part of our panel discussion. So from all of us that what challenges you face and how you have tried to overcome it through any majors uh, from your respective institutes or your respective domains. So that would be good to know that what path we can have on a scalable platform for future generations that they can think about or they can do something to add on this deinstitutionalization and adding a community setup for the mental health. 
patients having mental health issues. Uh, so, so this is now my subject. <laughs> I work in rehabilitation. So uh, there are many challenges. Uh, first challenge is the disease itself. Uh, even though when you treat it, uh, there are some residual symptoms. There are some uh, symptoms. symptoms. Okay. Uh, then uh, because of uh, uh, psychosis, because of severity of illness, patients have cognitive impairment. That is again a challenge for me. If I'm doing rehab, uh, I need to set certain goals. So their cognitive ability is again very important. So uh, cognition, cognitive impairment is a very big challenge for me. These are patients disease oriented problems. Then uh, when I want to uh, send him outside the hospital, there is nothing in between. Hospital setup is a totally different setup. And when you go outside in the community, when you go to work, that is totally different setup. So for a psychiatric patient, it's very difficult to adjust there. So there should be some place like a daycare center or a halfway home or a sheltered workshop, not a sheltered workshop actually, if patient has good abilities, they should, have, uh, they should be sent to halfway homes where they are observed for a certain period if there is any problem that can be treated and then it will be easier for them to go back to society. So absolute inavailability of such facilities is again a challenge for me. Mental hospitals government tried to set up some day center, but what they did, they set them inside mental hospital. So nobody wants to come there. There is a very big stigma. So social stigma is again a very challenge. Everyone faces whoever works with mental health. Then uh, again, there is a problem of uh, poverty, unemployment, broken relationships. So while rehabilitating these patients, it's in the problems I get. So here, uh, I think NGOs uh, should uh, come forward to help us. Uh, see, government can't reach everywhere. So it will be beneficial if NGOs help us in certain ways. Uh, and uh, I would also uh, like a symbiosis to do something about it. You have such a good setup. So how about you uh, starting something as a rehab therapist, some course about rehabilitation therapist. See, uh, inverse proportion of professionals and patients, that is again our challenge, even psychiatrists. We have very less number of psychiatrists available in society. If you are staying in big cities, you have that care available. But you go to even district places or rural areas, there is no psychiatrist available. So, uh, but it's not only psychiatrist. In mental health, it's a team. It's a teamwork. Means uh, uh, along with psychiatrist, who need you need clinical psychologist, you need occupational therapist, you need social worker. All these people they are not available in rural areas. So that is just a pharmacological treatment patients get, and then rehabilitation is not completely achieved like we uh, expect. So I think that is again a challenge we face. Uh, I could talk on this yeah. for a very long period. So I there think I should give it so much to someone else. <laughs> There are many challenges. I just remember what difficult the procedure of admission also used to be before with Mental Health Act, previous act. And it was quite difficult for the patient to get admitted with uh, different uh, protocols and different kind of uh, documents. And also, uh, we are proud to say that uh, Symbiosis Law School with the director, Shashikala Gurpur, ma'am, uh, I think we have set in one law, uh, legal aid facility at the regional mental hospitals. So whatever possible way each one of us can do, we are absolutely trying to do that. And that is a good move that people having mental illness can get legal aid available there at the regional mental hospital itself. Maybe it will be during the admission, it may be during the discharge or there any kind of rights which have been violated or not been protected through caregivers or family or other community members. So that is the most important step. Yes. Dr. Kostup, sir, maybe you can share about the challenges. Please. So again, multiple challenges. So I won't talk about all of them, but... I think the most important, at least in my own experience uh, from psychiatrists, then working with the communities for mental health issues, I think the language is the biggest challenge, uh, what I have understood. And, and what language I talk as a psychiatrist is completely 
nuance to a people who let's say working in the villages who are have a farming background who have a uh, let's say a shopkeeper background and so on and so forth uh, the next point about the language uh, as I, again as puja has said i'll just agree that everyone has their language of mental health so what we need to understand and that is where again the premise needs to change that psychiatrists or the mental health professionals not they only don't have a mental health language every one of uh, every one of a community member has their own language of mental health and unless and until we understand that language of mental health uh, i think now again we are talking here youths are there so youth has a different uh, language of mental health you know the children will have a different mental health language the, the geriatric population will have a different language so i think language is the huge challenge which we are still struggling with to be frank and again coming back to my earlier point is still the language used in mental health is the medicalized language and the clinical language like we use. So I think we have to change language if we are talking about the community mental health, access to mental care and so on and so forth. Uh, and it requires a lot of effort. So obviously I'm not saying it is an overnight thing that you will you know go into any community and start this. The other, I think, challenge is the scalability, I think. So again, uh, my point uh, and, and what we also work with at the center, so uh, I work specifically on a project called Atmiyata, which is basically closing the mental health care gap in the rural communities, uh, where we have trained people uh, from a lay people background. So not only health workers, so we have gone one level below where we have selected people or what we again call champions uh, who are from a different strata of the society, uh, from different caste, gender, different uh, religion and so on. And we have trained them to support their own communities for the psychosocial needs. Uh, and I think these kind of, uh, if we really want to close the gap, these kind of uh, programs, again, I'm not saying Atmiyata is the only one, there are multiple programs like this, which needs to be scaled up. And unless and until, you know, we scale up the programs, we are not going to uh, basically close the gap. Uh, and, and frankly, now with Atmiyata also, and now also our premise, like we work with different projects, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is already a lot of evidence. There is a lot of programs across low and middle income countries whether it's Africa, South Asia, India, that we can just adapt them and we can just, you know, convert them. Like, for example, let's going back to the halfway homes. You know, already like Banyan, like organization, already doing home again as a uh, program, which is on halfway homes and community reintegration. There are many states which have adopted that program. So I think the scalability is the biggest challenge right now we face. And, and this has to be like a movement because if we, you know, I always wonder and I always feel very sad that, uh, HIV AIDS came way after mental health issues. It came and it gone within two, three decades. Gone as in, it, you know, the stigma, discrimination, the overall uh, issues around HIV and AIDS have gone. Nobody talks about HIV and AIDS now, though people are there. So they have been integrated into the society. There is no discrimination happening now. And I'm struggling as a mental health. So I think the scalability, I think, is an important factor as much as the language, I would say. So. And so there is a disparity in the funding also if we see that what disorders get what kind of a funding from the central levels that also sometimes determines how that can be scaled up. So with your example of HIC that there had been a lot of funding for the HIV as compared to the mental health that has significantly impacted the both programs. Both are essential. We agree that both things are essential, but still mental health is lagging behind with compared to the service delivery and availability of the all professionals. Yes, sir. Uh, Pooja, if you want to share, um, please share. So uh, I'll continue on the scalability uh, point as well, because we are a large country with uh, a lot of need for access to quality mental health care. Um, is that, uh, I mean, uh, from our experience at uh, queer, uh, teaching the Queer Affirmative Counseling Practice course, QACP, is when we started five years ago, we got about 20 applications. And uh, now we are at about 550 counselors, psychologists, mental health practitioners have been trained. Now, if, if we imagined or had a vision for scaling this up, the next step is curriculum in educational institutions. Because how many are we going to reach, catch as they leave uh, training institutes? We would rather that this not be a post facto, sort of an afterthought, okay, now that I'm a psychologist, maybe I should become LGBTQI friendly. It again is from a rights-based perspective. So perhaps what we'd like 
ideally is for these kinds of material that even atmiyata generates or that qscp has generated to become part of curriculum that's the only way to be sustainable to reach to reach larger numbers uh, because when we say scalability we are not only saying numbers i'm not saying we need 1000 more qscp persons what or 1000 more psychologists we still have to ask what kind of psychologists what kind of counselors what is the quality of the training are they getting rights based training so scalability will have to involve both numbers as well as a perspective with which that scalability is done um and i'll just close my contribution uh, here with just one more comment to connect our topic of rights and mental health is to say that working on rights is also mental health work right and working on rights i'll just and off imagine a seven day weekend like how rest becomes political you see how the right to have a five day or a get that day of rest matters and the rest is not something that your employer or your teacher or your educational institution gives you as benevolence it's something you can demand and imagine then uh, you also have the right to feel angry if it's taken away from you and i think that's a true sort of check or a test of a right that if a right gets taken away you can be angry and you can demand it and that's mental health you know so uh, yeah just to close on that note thank you very much thank you just like to summarize it rights are inherently there everybody knows what are the rights and what are not the rights for an individual even if you are going on a traffic and if you see that somebody is crossing your signal or changing the lane you understand this is my lane or this is my signal why the other person is intruding but unfortunately with persons having mental illnesses there are sometimes some symptoms like apathy or not been able to respond to their situations and that significantly impacts their ability to fight for their right or get their rights in intact so that's how this is the responsibility of healthcare workers allied health professional to help them to help them recognize identify and bring about the change what is needed on a right based approach and community reintegration of that individual and also i would like to thank our uh, panelists and chief guests dr kaustub jo uh, pooja nayar dr snail sastekar for giving us valuable insights into this and i just want to conclude this with a thank you for one uh, visionary uh, may i know if anybody identifies uh, this person or this team yeah so the person at the center having a bouquet is uh, dr bharat watwani is a psychiatrist and he is practicing at kajar so he had been working on uh, destitutes who have been mentally ill and just kept on the road he reintegrated them he brought them to his uh, rehabilitation home called shraddha rehabilitation center in kajar he helped them to get rehabilitated and reintegrated into their families stressing their families so for this gen uh, global work he had been awarded with max essay award in 2017 and there is a wonderful movie a documentary based on it uh, faith beyond peer so i would recommend you to do watch it to know more about mental health and human rights and thank you everyone thank you for being part of this panel discussion yeah i would like to have some question answers for sure so if there are any questions please uh, So yeah, this is uh, the forum is now open for question answers because we have a young generation sitting here who are very creative and very open-minded and uh, who are very aware of their rights and responsibilities. Uh, so I want to really encourage students to ask questions because uh, with very you know they are very very uh, have hectic schedules. So we've got them here. Make most of it. so i have a question for me okay so i my name is pranjal i am from the first batch of bsc mental health so my question is actually for kaustub sir i have written it down so now that uh, you all have made it clear that mental health issues can intersect with various aspects of an individual's life so i have two questions firstly 
uh, how are like are there any legal mechanisms to understand to address the intersection of mental health and other areas of law such as family law criminal law human right law and after like when you mentioned crpd after india ratified the international standards put forward by crpd with regards to mental health i'm sure implementing it on a ground level would have been difficult given our diverse culture and population so uh, when so how well does our national law align with the crpd law because india not only has you know because of the culture and population we surely face a lot of problems uh, while creating national laws in alignment with the international law so how was the gap identification done so in fact so basically uh, two things first uh, the premise of mental health care law or mental health care act is only for the mental health care and and that i think it it doesn't cut across you know the other legal uh, or legal provisions we have and the premise is mental capacity is different than a legal capacity now this is the worldwide debate going on we, whether a person who has a mental health issue loses the capacity of a decision making then then whether it's only mental concept or it is a legal concept and the crpd takes takes stands that this is this is only the mental concept it is not the legal concept and and why we are again why this is connected to the rights because the capacity of person is gone now their rights are gone so then that's why they are indivisible you know so that is how the historically there is a stamp that once you get diagnosed with mental health issues your capacity is gone forever so you don't have a rights and many countries till now don't have a voting rights for people with mental health issues there are no rights for marriage property as i said earlier so what mental health care act has done is it has segregated saying ki mental health care act is only for mental health care correct so that's the one uh, uh, one kind of a point you need to understand now the other laws in our countries whether it's a marriage law whether it's a property law contract law and so on and so forth so there is now still the debate debate as in the, there are a lot of pils in the supreme court which is going on so the, now there is a huge problem of the language so the other laws use the language of unsound mind uh, and the unsound mind has been equated with the lack of capacity basically and there is a huge again as i said there is a lot of movement which is going against the unsound mind and unless until we remove this word unsound mind because nobody can define unsound mind you know what is unsound mind you know i can also have unsound mind uh, I, any one of us can have that so that's the problem but hopefully uh, with uncrpd in place mental health care act has changed uh, rights of persons with disabilities act has now uh, come forward uh, four years back which has changed now which is more rights oriented so hopefully slowly and gradually uh, the ch law changes will happen in fact it is a mandated so no country can get devised because and and what what is a good thing about united nations uh, conventions and ratifications these are linked with the financial support so if you don't follow or if you don't mandate uh, you do then the world bank will stop your uh, financially so as a policy maker you are <laughs> mandated to follow the law at least for the economic reasons basically yeah thank you sir uh, good morning sir and good morning everyone uh, greetings uh, i'm avinash matkar from uh, bsc mental health uh, so uh, i'm into uh, like Uh, we have collaborated with the scope department for uh, uh, going into rural places and providing uh, uh, like uh, mobile medical units we have uh, so uh, while working i thought uh, i should i should make a, a preventive social model for uh, vulnerable groups in the rural communities so uh, first question is uh, i just want your insights or comments uh, on this uh, topic and second is uh, if you could offer some uh, help uh, in uh, like in collaboration for uh, this thing so collab then start Uh, 
maybe i can start and uh, both of you can add so so basically thanks thanks for bringing that and thanks for i think going into communities basically so that's the important point here that we have to get out of our cabins and our you know the offices and go into the communities otherwise you know talking about community mental health sitting in the office doesn't make sense uh, and plus see what my point is only uh, uh, again learning from community mental health is and remember that as as uh, already been spoken by puja that how if you are not there their mental i'm just giving you the overview point i, I know it's, it's start of your career or you are still under training but i'm just giving you a point think in your life how you make community sustainable uh, to take their you know to, to address their mental health needs and that should be your point uh, you know as, as a goal or a aim of your uh, if you are working in community mental health if you are the only one who is providing care and it, once you go away from the community they are helpless then that's not the work uh, i think we should envision we should as a community mental health practitioners we should enable uh, communities to take their own mental health needs basically and if you do that in your life whether you do it in a 10 villages, one village, 15 village, whatever number, I think you have done the uh, good for the communities. I don't know if that answers your questions, but that's how I place the community mental health. Collaboration. So, col ha, so collaboration is a, is, a, is a more at a, yes, sure. So obviously, uh, at least from my end, I can say, and we already have preliminarily spoken about collaboration, but this was the first time I am also coming here so we will definitely do and I, I good to know that you have a peer counseling program so which is also so we are also based in the law college so we also have ILS which is a law college has a law college so we are also closer to the youths uh, in that sense so definitely there is a many elements on collaboration uh, so I'll quickly just add uh, a sort of a framework which I'm sure you've also experienced in your work on community mental health is that a classification between mental health needs in terms of mental illness support, that, that kind of medical care, psychosocial support, etc., is one kind of mental health, community mental health work. The other kind of community mental health work is also responding to the needs in the community that impact their mental health. For example, land rights, for example, ration, the absence of perhaps ration cards or the need for ration cards, electricity, water, roads, hospitals. So I'm saying that community mental health work then also becomes this collaborative project, which is much larger than mental illness. And I'm sure that's part of uh, the work in a community, right? So connecting to other forms of resources and other kinds of initiatives will be important to reimagine community as community and not to isolate illness in a community. Yeah. Uh, when you said help, I don't know what you expected, but uh, I would like to uh, tell you, uh, we will be more than happy to work in collaboration with you people. Uh, Symbiosis Law School already, uh, they work with us. So uh, since you are working in community and you are reaching people there, uh, we would uh, definitely like to help in whatever you, way you want us to. And we will use uh, your uh, uh, reach programs and all for uh, uh, our benefit also. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what help you are expecting, but we will talk about it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, panelists. And uh, thank you, students, for being actively listening to this panel discussion. And now just coming to the final conclusion that why it is said rights-based approach. And if we see the subtle theme, our rights, our minds, our rights, it is definitely asking us to make, enable the community itself that they can take care of their own rights to mental health measures. And it is there, it is a when I read first time, our minds, our rights, the first thing came to my mind like Sadak, Etherak. So they want their rights to be protected and fulfilled. And would like to welcome Dr. Rajiv Yarvadekar, sir, uh, Provost for Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. Yes. So Dr. Rajiv Edwardekar, may I have a privilege to introduce sir. The sir is gold medal awardee at MD Obstetrics and Gynecology. He has topped the Maharashtra Public Service Commission examination. And yeah, 
okay sir he is currently the provost for faculty of medical and health sciences and we may continue our further program agendas so i would request uh, senior psychologist tyra to guide about the capacity building program that we are initiating at symbiosis center for emotional through symbiosis center for emotional well being across the symbiosis international university and that will help us to under, understand what kind of a uh, rights should be reaching to all the individuals who are stakeholders for this uh, community health and mental health preservation thank you Thank you, Dr. Rahul. The Symbiosis Mental Health Champions Program is a one-year voluntary peer support initiative. Okay. I'd like to thank all the panelists for a very wonderful discussion, enriching and enlightening for all of us to sort of contemplate and think about our part when it comes to advocacy and community mental health and, uh, and creating spaces that are inclusive and keep in mind universal human rights. So thank you to all the, panel, the panelists today. I move on to the next part of our program today, which is to talk a little bit about the capacity building uh, initiatives that take place in Symbiosis University, one being the Mental Health Champions Program. The Symbiosis Mental Health Champions Program is a one-year voluntary peer support initiative for Symbiosis students who are passionate about supporting and advocating for the mental health needs of their peers. These champions exemplify many positive qualities, such as empathy, compassion, and a desire to make a difference to those around them. Champions are trained in areas concerning mental health, such as psychological first aid or stress management. They assist their campus counselors and the Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing in creating supportive campus environments by organizing and promoting various activities related to emotional health. They also advocate and destigmatize mental illness and encourage their peers to seek counseling. In turn, they build their own skills, strengths, and leadership abilities. We are proud to announce that this year, we had a total of 620 applications come, for, come in for this program from all SIU campuses. This is a change from two years ago when we started with a small batch of 50 champions, after which we moved to 180 champions in 2022 and 23. And now we are going into 629 applications that have come in for this year. Therefore, percolating into the system and having students advocate for their own mental health. The 2023 batch gives a warm welcome to the new incoming batch who come on board today on this auspicious occasion of World Mental Health Day. We look forward to making a collective impact. Here's a glimpse of all the activities carried out by our 2023 batch of champions this year.
we had to understand that the most impact is created when we encourage and empower students to lead advocacy initiatives. I'm proud to say as faculty of the mental health advocacy course, along with the support of other faculty members, Dr. Navi, Dr. Girija, uh, Dr. Purva, Dr. Uh, Vidya, uh, we have, and the SKU team members, uh, we are very proud to present and share that as part of the mental health advocacy course, the BSc students have prepared a set of skits to build awareness and promote mental health, uh, which they will be presenting to you in a short while. I hand this back to my colleague, Dr. Purva. Thank you, Taira. Uh, of course, we are going to move on to the skate. Uh, yeah, that's uh, after the prize distribution. So may I call upon stage our honorable provost, Dr. Rajiv, sir, to felicitate the students with the awards. All, yeah, I'll announce. Yes. Sorry? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah. I, so these prizes are for the essay competition and slogans organized by Department of Psychiatry at SMCW on World Suicide Prevention Day, 10 September 2023. The first prize goes to Simon Nair, SMCW. The second prize goes to Devika Srivatsava. The third prize goes to Haifa uh, Fahim SMCW. So these were the prizes for the SM, uh, SMCW competition. Now moving on to the MindFest competition that we have organized on World Mental Health Day. Let me uh, call upon stage the winners for real our own students, Gaurav, Manas Sisode, and Manas Biswas. They have won the first prize for the reels. Doctor. Good morning, everyone. So our reel was about everyday choices and how they will uh, eventually show up into your life. So every day we are faced with stress in one form or another. And as students, for us, the most common two stressors were either studies or relationship problems. But we, are, we thought we'll go with education because it's a far more relatable one. And every few weeks, sometimes there's an assignment that's very late or you are too stressed about it and you're staying up late. And at 1 a.m. when it feels all lost, you are very stressed. So how will you cope with that? That defines how your results will be. So we tried to show two simultaneous ways in which two different students coped. Uh, the reel was edited by my friend Manas Biswas and we all three co-wrote it and Manas Isode and I, we acted in it. So we tried to show that one student copes in a healthy manner. He listens to some songs, yeah. takes a break, tries to calm down and studies again. And one turns to drugs and eventually he's like relaxing, spending time on his phone and tries to uh, deal with stress through use of substances. Eventually for one time it's understandable, maybe it can be excused. But if you continuously keep uh, doing this behavior, eventually it's gonna show into your results and that's how we try to show it through our reel. Where eventually the student above gets good marks and the student below fails. Thank you. We going to play the reel? We have already done that, ma'am. Do okay. you want me to repeat it again? No, no. Sir, if, sir. <laughs> okay, so sir, we'll see it. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you, sir. So, uh, moving on to the next, the for the posters, we Can have we the give... winners, Rachana yeah. Zadav and- oh, Dr. Purva, we've not give, presented them with the gift. Oh. 
I'm so sorry for that, sir. I'm so sorry for this, sir. This was. So big round of applause for the budding counselors here. So reels are a great way to connect with the youth, right? I mean, you all are on social media. So let's make good use of social media for building awareness around healthy coping strategies. Moving on to the next uh, winner. This is for the posters that students have made. We have Rachna Jadav and Aishna Srivastava, who has won. Do you want to share about your poster? And So my poster was about the self-care, like how you like to spend your day-to-day -day activities, like you are busy all the time. I'm an MBA student from uh, Symbiosis. So our curriculum is very stressed. So how you take out your time and spend time on doing your hobbies, which you're not able to spend these days. So this is my poster. Excellent. So students coming up with solutions for students. I think what better way? Who are we to tell you what to do for you know relaxation? I think students come up with excellent strategies. Thank you so much. So moving on to uh, the next segment of this uh, mental fest, we have winners of poetry, Saumili Vishwas and Angela Freddy. So we had uh, five themes uh, for the mental health festival. Uh, there were essays, posters, reels that students had to make and uh, you know, beautiful creativity displayed. You want to share about your poem? So, my poem was about uh, how poem. we can compare life and hope to different. Okay, so uh, I we dis I describe life and hope as it can be compared to various things that we see around us, like uh, books, roller coasters, the different things we experience, and that is how I cre created this. And it it really, you know, I didn't even expect to, it to come out this well. So I thank uh, the faculty for providing such a wonderful opportunity. Congratulations. Hope is a very powerful medium. Uh, it gives us me gives meaning to our life, right? And instilling hope in students. What a beautiful way of instilling hope through poetic composition. Thank you so much. I request Astekar, Madam, to please. Thank you so much, ma'am. So moving on to the last segment, it was essay on different, you want to say? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the first poem, that was mine. Uh, basically, uh, I wrote the poem, I wrote the poem from the very beginning of life. So as a child, we come into this world with unblemished hearts and minds. And after we enter the society, it is the society which changes us in a way. So your family, your friends, everyone around you has an impact on you. And similarly, there are certain stereotypes which kind of uh, gets inside you. So it, this is the society we live in where uh, women have certain ro roles to follow as well as men have certain roles to follow. And so in my poem, uh, I have written one verse for women and one verse for men, and one for the people who are outside this binary. So, yeah, that's my point. Thank you so much. That's indeed very inclusive. Uh, thank you so much, dear. I request Ms. Pooja to please felicitate. Okay. 
Congratulations. Is he? So for this essay segment, as I just announced, Prachi Ro and Suhani Agrawal are the winners. May I please request essay competition winners? Sorry, essay. Pragati Durna from Symbiosis Center for Management Studies. Share a few words. So I wrote on the topic, embrace life and so uh, say no to drugs. So I wrote uh, like uh, how drug affects our life and the ways like we can avoid drugs and what are the ways like we can stay positive in our life. So again, very important social message. Again, when it comes from students, it has a much wider impact. What we are planning to do is all these essays, uh, we are going to uh, post it and put it up on notice boards across campuses. So that students can read what students think about drugs so that if it can impact you in a positive way, uh, you know, it will really be nice. So I'd request Kaustup sir to felicitate. No, no, she is referencing. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I wrote an essay on uh, empathy and compassion, like how it's really necessary in today's time. And it, I basically described the importance, like how people are uh, too much into hatred nowadays. Like uh, as per my experience, as, as per I have seen the world till now, I have seen that many of our youth is basically, once their heart get broken, they kind of get, uh, get very sad and they will just try to get into hatred more. Rather, uh, they will just stop believing in love and empathy and compassion. So that's what I described in my essay. So yeah, and I really believe that uh, these two uh, feelings have a lot of power to change the world. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, dear. I request uh, Rajiv sir to felicitate. Okay, we would also now take this opportunity to felicitate our esteemed panelists who have made the time out of their hectic schedules and come all the way to Lovre. So we are really, really grateful for coming here. I request Dr. Rajiv sir to felicitate Dr. Kaustub Zog. There is one more winner we have from the Bangalore campus for essay competition. We just want to announce them, Ayansha Srivastav, and we'll uh, look into how we can deliver this prize to her at Bangalore campus. Thank you. Training in progress. <laughs> I now Thank request uh, Dr. Vijay Sagar, sir, Dean Symbiosis Medical College for Women, to felicitate uh, Dr. S uh, Snehal Sastekar, madam, occupational therapist at Regional Mental Hospital, Yerada. She has been working as an occupational therapist for more than 30 years. Has, and I have personally been to the Regional Mental Hospital. Very humble, very kind. The way she connects with the peop, uh, clients there is really worth experiencing. So I encourage our BSc mental health students to do, you know, visit the regional mental hospital to gain field experience there. We are collaborating with the regional mental hospital to get you internships over there so that you can be a part of the community work over there. I now request uh, Dr. Samita Jadhav, Madam, uh, Director, Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences, to felicitate our third panelist, Ms. Pooja Nair who is doing some brilliant work, guys. I mean, 
coming up with a queer affirmative course uh, you know working for the rights of lgbtqi plus community is phenomenal and uh, we would also like to collaborate with umbrella health initiative uh, in whatever capacity we can uh, so that we can you know we can scale up all the uh, work that we are doing jointly yeah uh, done thank you so much sir uh, i would request rajiv sir to share a few thoughts um good mood morning everyone in most fora which i address in the capacity of provost of the faculty of medical and health sciences i do make a mention that the faculty of medical and health sciences is at an inflection point and it's meant to make a distinct presence felt in the symbiosis international university ecosystem and as provost many times i do dwell and ponder as to which institute or which program could make a mark or difference there is the flagship prototype mbbs program there are programs and institutes which have been established over a couple of decades now there are programs which are being launched or which are envisioned to be launched in the near future but one institute one department or one program which has made a mark in the symbiosis ecosystem is the symbiosis center for emotional well being and i am not saying this as lip service because today i am speaking on the occasion of the world mental health day one of the parameters or one of the indices on which i judge the penetration or percolation and the connect which an institute or a program has within the symbiosis ecosystem with which i call as the internal ecosystem of symbiosis is when students and faculty members from different institutes participate in a program or an initiative of that particular department and even within the faculty of medical and health sciences and even within hardcore programs organized by one department and in medical parlance psychiatry is considered as one of the minor departments no disrespect meant to uh, dr naik and his team but even within the symbiosis medical ecosystem medical college ecosystem the big brothers medicine surgery obs gynae ortho and pediatrics so as to say call the shots we all know we are medicals but to have the likes of dr rizwood being here dr veena purandare being here the dean himself being here amongst other faculty members of the dr amol being here because these guys generally are too busy with their clinical work but they deemed it worthwhile to come and attend this function on the world mental health day as well as the directors of the other institutes dr parimala is not directly connected with the symbiosis center for emotional well being and then within the symbiosis institute of health sciences you got dr samita of course as the director you got dr uh, the, the professor maral dr uh, you know uh, kavita and everyone here dr uh, and besides your internal faculty within the symbiosis center for emotional well being whether it's uh, dr rahul or you know dr nabi they are bound to be here but the fact that you could manage to get all of them here speaks volumes of how you connect and the and the inroads you have made into their function and this is something which i judge as one of the parameters or index of uh, you know uh, percolation and penetration they by a connect because when you talk about say you take public health ragu is here why should ragu come for this program now is mental health related to public health well the denominator of health is common but does ragu go for other programs which are organized by the other institutes no but then there is some charm which is exercised by girija maybe by sangeeta maybe by tahira by which he comes here i don't know but the matter of fact is that it's a beautiful synergy and a true symbiosis in sync with our motto vasudeva kutumbakam 
that all the faculty members and students from diverse programs, you got students from law, you got students from SCMS, you got students from engineering, you got students participating in to get a, a response from the students to participate, whether for essays, whether for comp, uh, poems or whether for skits is something very appreciated. The second reason for this is you harness the powerful medium of social media. I see umpteen number of messages and umpteen number of communications by Team Skew every day or the other. Something or the other is going on. So that 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 thread of communication and thread of continuity by Skew is something which ensures the continuity and thereby the sustainability of Skew initiatives. So hats off to you, Dr. Girija, Dr. Rahul. Taira and the entire other faculty members for making SKU's presence well felt in the Symbiosis ecosystem. And yes, you need to clap. And the girl students sitting in the back benches need to clap, clap louder. Why do I say that? Because as you pass out in 2025, 26, 25 onwards, our first batch passes out in 2025. Besides these glamour branches of medicine, surgery, OBSA and gynae, which are fast not becoming the major branches and guys like Amol and others are taking over fast as the major bidders and they have seats bidded for 10 CR, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, is what I read on social media. But the fact is that mental health professionals and you as a prototype psychiatrist within a team of psychologists, counselors and an entire paraphernalia of mental health professionals have an important nodal role to play. So please, much as we lament Samita, me and Dean sir and other medicos in our undergraduate days, probably did not give as much weightage to psychiatry as we should have given. Not that we are at the sufferers today, but we do realize that we as healthcare providers are handicapped because we did not pay the requisite attention and give the requisite importance to mental health. Psychiatry was always a minor branch for us. We were, though we were taught like very from by various illustrious persons, including Dr. Mohan Agashi, sir, and so many other uh, teachers, both in the BJ Medical College and the AFMC, iconic institutions, medical institutions in the country. But probably we were no wise, we were immature, we were not aware of the importance mental health is going to play in years to come. Whether it's World Suicide Prevention Day, whether it's saying no to drugs and symbiosis for you all, you know, is a strict zero tolerance policy for alcohol and drugs, or whether it's gender issues or working in the prisons along with Shashikala Gurpur, which Dr. Girija is ably handling, or the Center for Learning Disabilities, which Sangeeta is handling. And Madam, I would strongly request you to be associated with the Center for Learning Disabilities because as occupational therapists, we, we strongly need, and we are, we, are, we are coming up with the Center for Rehabilitative Sciences, and uh, Samita is working on it. Um, we would strongly require a presence of an occupational therapist behind, beyond the major mainstream physiotherapists and the others, speech therapists, etc. So the association in the three organizations which you represent, Kostub is in an independent capacity, but he's associated with the law college, another iconic institution in the city. And both Dr. Snehal as well as um, uh, Madam uh, Puja, if you can continue your association beyond this one one off event of, uh, of of the celebration or commemoration of World Mental Health Day, we would look forward to have you amidst us. As they say, the soil of symbiosis is like the sands of Hawaii. Once it gets into your shoes, it's difficult to have it removed. And we cherish this association. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation and we look forward to a company association. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind words, sir. Okay, the, uh, the winners have arrived for the competition that we have held. So may I request Dean, sir,